Hey everybody, I'm Jack Reeder with Future Pastimes, and I'm the designer of the Ecasm Moritani expansion, which is the third expansion for the classic Dune board game, the 2019 edition from Gale Force 9. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about one of the variants from that expansion, and it's probably my favorite variant now for Dune, and it is Homeworlds. So in the Dune universe, every faction has its own homeworld. You tradees have Caladan, and the Harkonnen have Gady Prime, and the Bene Gesserit have Wallach Nine, uh, the Tleilaks who have Tleilaks, etc. So what's going to happen is in the game, every faction is going to be given a cardboard planet token that they're going to place in front of their shield there, and you're going to put your reserves there. That's where your reserves go. So the Fremen actually have a little mini Arrakis, which represents the Southern Hemisphere, and that's where their reserves are. And you are also going to have an accompanying Homeworld card, and each side of that Homeworld card has some different effects on it. So the primary side is called your High Threshold side, and it's going to have a number of your reserves um, that if they are on your Homeworld, you're going to have a special unique extra advantage that you can use in the game. So it's like having another faction advantage. Um, and it's tied to having a high threshold of your reserves. Now, as the game goes on and you begin to ship uh, your forces from your reserves onto Arrakis, uh, those the reserve num numbers will go down. And when they go down below that number for your high threshold, you're going to flip that card over to its low threshold side. So you will lose your high threshold advantage and you will then incur, in most cases, a little bit of a handicap. Um, now, a couple of the factions, the Fremen and the Harkonnen, they have no low threshold handicap. And uh, Chome actually has a high threshold handicap, but uh, that goes away when they go to low threshold and then they gain uh, an advantage. So theirs is a little bit uh, different. Uh, but by and large, being at low threshold means that you are incurring some sort of penalty that you have to contend with. So part of what's going to happen now when you're playing Dune is you're going to be thinking about how long do you want to take advantage of having that extra uh, thing that you can do by staying at high threshold. And when are you going to really commit your forces to Arrakis uh, and going for the win, because then you're going to be at a little bit of a disadvantage for being at low threshold. Now, being at low threshold is not all bad news. One of the things that does happen when you switch over to your low threshold side is that your free revival rate is increased by one. Also, your Chome Charity will be increased by one. And that just means if you collect Chome Charity you will collect one more spice. And that one extra spice is from the bank, not from Chome, if Chome is in the game. So, for instance, if you only have one spice, you will get one spice from Chome and one spice from the bank to get you up to three spice. But the idea being that if you've gone to low threshold, uh, you probably you went for the win or you had a big battle, but uh, now there, you're very likely uh, hurting because you have a lot of forces in the tanks and maybe you're out of spice as well. So the idea here is low threshold. We're trying to mitigate that a little bit. Not by not by much, but still better than nothing. Um, but there's one extra little twist here with the home worlds. And it is very thematic. It's right out of uh, several of the books. Um, players can now attack each other's home worlds and occupy them. So when you're using your shipping action, instead of shipping from your reserves down to the board on Arrakis, you can ship from your reserves to someone else's homeworld and battle them there. Or if nobody's there, just occupy them immediately. And every homeworld, the very bottom of the low threshold side of the card, shows the occupier advantage. So you get an advantage for occupying someone else's homeworld, and you will also incur a little bit of an income from the spice bank, even in basic. So uh, the stakes are much higher now in the game of Dune because of the homeworlds. Um, the central focus of the game is still on Arrakis. That's how you win the game. So homeworlds don't count as strongholds. Occupying three homeworlds isn't going to win you the game. Um, but it might help you to win the game. For example, if you occupy Tleilax, um, the Tleilaxu can't call face dancers on you or your ally if you're in an alliance. 
and that could be a big deal. Uh, there are many other advantages to occupying someone else's home world. Um, in addition to that spice income, you might be getting more spice. So occupying Kaitane can be a, a big advantage for you because you're eating into the emperor's income. Same thing with occupying Junction. That's going to affect the spacing guild. They're not going to be earning as much spice and you will be stealing spice from them. So this is adding a, a little bit more complexity to the game. So I'm going to say that definitely Homeworlds is the most complex variant in the third expansion. The Nexus cards are very easy to understand and uh, easy to implement. Discovery tokens as well. Homeworlds are a little bit more. So this is going to be, it's not necessarily for advanced game because you can play it in basic, but um, you probably shouldn't until you are at a certain comfort level with Dune. You're familiar enough with what the factions do. You're not always having to read, you know, what are all the things that the Fremen can do or the Harkonnen. Um, you instinctively know that. You're familiar enough with those things. So now you can add in this extra level. Because you do have to pay attention to the uh, number of your forces in your reserves. It also helps to occasionally look at what everyone else is doing and when they're going to dip below. So, like I said, that's a it's another level of complexity and depth of, uh, of the game. Um, but I, I love that sort of thing. Uh, and I've been playing Dune for many, many years. I'm familiar with um, all of the factions. And um, so I'm ready for that sort of thing. And I really enjoyed it. It had so much interesting gameplay to Dune. Um, somebody that is sending a bunch of forces down to Arrakis uh, early in the uh, shipping and, and movement uh, order. And you're like, oh, they're, they're pretty weak. I could go uh, attack their home world. Because if they don't, uh, if they're not successful or whatever, um, uh, this could have a big impact on um, the next turn as well. And this is especially important when there's a lot of stronghold blocking going on. You're like, well, you know, I can't get into the strongholds I want to. There is now a juicy target somewhere else uh, and occupying them. Now, there are a couple other little things I haven't explained. Um, there, uh, There's no calling traitors in a... Uh, battle on a, on a home world, uh, except for the native uh, faction. So if you're attacking Caladan, the Atreides can call traitor if you play a leader in their battle that is a traitor. But, uh, you know, if you're the Harkonnen and they Atreides plays one of your traitors, can't call them on the home world. There's too much pressure there on Caladan to keep things going. So even though they're in your employ, you got to wait until they're out uh, on Arrakis or on your own home world. Uh, same thing with face dancers, so that doesn't happen. There's also a little bit of a home world, um, you know, home uh, turf advantage. So every card will have a, a number that is added to your battle total, um, irrespective of, of how many of your forces you dial or the strength of your leaders. So it is tougher to beat the natives on their own planet. Um, and that is if there is a battle. So if they've got no forces on there, there's no battle. You just land and you occupy um, and, uh, there's a similar thing. That same number is applied to losses for the native faction if there is a laser gun shield explosion on the home world. So that happened early in one of our play tests. Somebody sent one guy over to a home world that was filled with reserves and, um, they had the laser gun and the shield and they just wanted to blow everybody up. And we all had a good laugh, and then the, the rules got changed so that that was no longer... It's not really what we want to have happen. Um, you know, you do a laser gun shield explosion in Arakeen, it doesn't wipe out uh, everybody on the planet. So it's uh, localized. So you would only, you know, and for one of the examples here, you'd only lose two of your forces if you were the native faction here in a laser gun shield explosion. So it's not really worth it to purposely try to do that. Um, but it still adds a lot of interesting tactical moves. And um, we, we had a game where the Fremen kept harassing the guild on Junction, occupying them there. And uh, the, the guild said, well, we're going to harass the Fremen in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, it just was a lot of fun watching that unfold. And uh, until they were ready to really go for the, the win. So it's adding a little more to the game. It's more to pay attention. Um, but it's opening up the universe of Dune in a big way. And um, really allowing the factions to do a little bit more. Um, take advantage of certain weaknesses that they normally 
would have. It kind of counters that in some ways. Um, and uh, it, it incentivizes players to make some other interesting choices. So that's home worlds. I'm going to go into depth on um, each of the home worlds in a subsequent video, but I just wanted to go into a little more depth just on it and show off uh, a lot of these home worlds right now so players can get um, a sense at what some of those do. Uh, and um, yeah, let me know what you think of home worlds. And um, if you have any questions, uh, that's it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.